Today we conclude our series on Heaven's Gate. We'll discuss Marshall Applewhite's attempt to bring Heaven's Gate out of isolation and the tactics he used to try to recruit new members. We'll also look at his plan to have the government take them out, as well as what led to him finally deciding it was time to exit their vehicles and travel to the next level. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If your bracket is already busted because you chose your shitty home team, stick around. Tonight, we're betting it all on the away team. This is Necronomapod. They are members of a group calling itself Heaven's Gate, a group of people who apparently shared the same beliefs in life, beliefs that appear to have prompted them to plan their own deaths. A tragedy that will impact families across the nation. The dead are from the states of California, New Mexico, Texas, Florida, Washington, Minnesota, Utah, and Ohio. A handwritten note accompanying the videotape stated, By the time you receive this, we'll be gone, several dozen of us. We came from the level above human in distant space, and we have now exited the bodies that we were wearing for our earthly task to return to the world from whence we came. Task completed. So I think we decided, uh, Ian, that the uh, the two parts Heaven's Gate is going to be what, about five parts now? Yeah, we're going to let it go like halfway into April. <laughs> Just hijack the whole spring with Heaven's Gate. I think I would quit right now. Yeah? Be over this? And I'm done. Well, I guess we kind of ruined it on the beginning when I, in my little summary, I said that we conclude our series today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, joke that ruined. Joke. <laughs> Ugh. Spoiler alert. I don't know about you guys, but I am awfully tired tonight. Yeah? I'm trying to kick it into high gear. It's awfully nice of you to show up anyway. Had a cup of coffee at 7.30, which means I'm not sleeping tonight. Mm, interesting. Very weak to caffeine. Did you not sleep well last night? Were you... Uh... Yeah, just didn't sleep well. Mm. I guess that's what happens when you're out partying with strippers and doing coke <laughs> off their asses. <laughs> you're, you're living the life, man. What are you going to do? <laughs> Podcast stars now. It's just these invitations just, <laughs> you know, flood our inboxes. We're just not going to not do it. Is that what podcast stars do? I guess so. That's what this podcast star does. (laughs) Yeah. I was hanging out with uh, Joe Rogan and uh, I don't know, such and such that also has a big podcast. (laughs) I can't think of any other person that has a podcast and literally everybody has a podcast. The visual I'm getting here, like trying to think about Mike doing bumps off a stripper's ass in the the VIP room is quite amusing. (laughs) Well... (laughs) I mean, have you ever done a bump <laughs> off of a male stripper's ass? They're really toned and firm so and is, muscular. Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, that's how I party. I will take your word for it, sir. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. We got uh, Heaven's Gate Part 3 here. We're going to wrap this story up. We'll talk about some Nikes and, you know, pop their business a little bit. <laughs> Everyone looking for those decades now. Just do it, Mike. Just do it. <laughs> don't ask questions. That's what they did. Um, so, all right, Ian, take it away. So, where we left off on part two, Doe, a.k.a. Marshall Applewhite, had ironed out the changes to the belief system since T, a.k.a. Bonnie Nettles, died. And now it was time to take a break from that 12-year period of isolation they had been living in. In 1988, the group sent out a document called the 88 Update. Much like the first time they sent out any of their materials back in the early 70s, this was sent to New Age and metaphysical groups and stores, churches, prominent people in the UFO world, and groups like MUFON. Did NICAP probably also get some? I'm sure they did. I think like Stanton Friedman probably got a copy. <laughs> Everybody in the UFO world got a copy of this. Well, Mike, prominent people in the UFO world. I mean, that's a high, it's a high standard. <laughs> These are important people. Those are VIPs. I mean, countrywide. Dang, you're tiptoeing a line, Pally. You're about to set Ian off. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Philip Class got any? Well, he's the top VIP from what Ian yeah. used to tell us. Well, I think. I agree. He had it right. I'm just going to ignore that comment. <laughs> I'm going to respond to it. <laughs> Ian's like, I'm having a good day. I had pizza that was half cooked. It's a real good good day for me. I know. I'm trying to, I'm drinking coffee now like you are. I'm trying to wake up a bit. I ate two pieces before I walked down here to record. <laughs> I'm moving slow here. <laughs> now that we've sold how awesome this show is going to be that we're all falling asleep while trying to record it. People are like, fuck these guys. These guys are super marketing promoters over there. 
You can hear one of us snoring yeah. at the end of the episode. Yeah, I might be awake for the whole show. I might not. I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> let go and let God. <laughs> so the 88 update is long. It's like 14 or 15 pages. And it lays out everything that we've talked about so far with how T and Doe met. Uh, they found their purpose on life. You know, they're the two messengers sent from God, all that kind of stuff. But now there was a lot more of a religious angle to some of it towards the end. Like we had said on part two, Doe was saying that everything in the Bible was matter of fact. It was just aliens. They also brought up a lot about conspiracies regarding the government covering up the existence of aliens and how that actually tied into there being a conspiracy to keep people from getting the information that Doe and the group were trying to get out. Like those two things were connected. Sounds a lot like uh, Andrew Basiago. It's not his name. The uh, oh yeah, Project Pegasus guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be covering this alien Bible uh, nonsense. I don't. I was, I was <laughs> searching for the right word to use <laughs> <laughs> on a future Bible Babble episode. This tomfoolery. Uh, tomfoolery. That's not bad. That's a good one. I'm 99.9 percent sure. If you look at like the episode history for Ancient Aliens on the History Channel, there's a couple episodes about the Bible and UFOs. Oh, I recall watching that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, it's more believable face. than the actual stories in the Bible. So uh, it's understandable. <laughs> Bible babble, folks. Bible babble. <laughs> He's a resident Bible expert. Well, that's true. Someone had to take that. Uh, Have at it. Take that moniker. At the end of the 88 update, they attached some recommended reading for people. Um, and the ones that I found notable that I would recommend to anybody that wanted to read about UFOs. Uh, they had the Roswell incident by Bill Moore on there. We talked about that during the uh, Majestic 12 episode. Bill Moore doing his uh, investigation with Stanton Friedman. Like that's where the, the grays came from, right? Didn't he essentially invent that term? Or am I thinking of someone else? I went out of a limb here and I really didn't know what I was talking about <laughs> based on Ian's <laughs> <and his> Mike. <laughs> I mean, the Greys, that would have been Betty and Barney Hill. They were the first ones to give that a... The, 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 like the description. The yeah, the description. Yeah. Of them. I'm thinking of something else. Uh, Communion by Whitley Strieber. Dave, you know Whitley. Yeah, I know Whitley. He took over Dreamland after yeah. a while from Art. He was always on Art Bell. Oh, yeah. That's an awesome book, too. I, I'd want to do a whole episode on Whitley Strieber and his alien abduction stories. That's a fun one. And then Night Siege by J. Allen Hynek, which that's about the Hudson Valley UFOs, which that's on the list to do an episode in the future. We've talked about Hynek a few times, too, in the past. Yeah, there's only like a core group of guys we're ever going to really talk about with <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> it's the same. It's a reoccurring uh, cast. Oh, those important VIPs across the country, the influential right. UFO people. Yep. I noticed no Philip Class novel on that book or on that list. No. I would imagine they, they don't <laughs> like him very much. <laughs> He's the bad boy of the UFO world. Yeah, yeah. He tells it like it is. He doesn't <laughs> fluff it up for the, the <laughs> listeners and the readers. <laughs> the one thing I found really funny when I was reading through the 88 update and I got to the end there and I was like going through all this, their recommended stuff, is they recommended um, some articles and things that, that people should look into. Ed Walters <laughs> down in Gulf Breeze, Florida <laughs> and all his UFO sightings. <laughs> One of the funniest shows we've ever done. <laughs> Super authentic with that model they found in his uh, ad a couple of years later that exactly matched the photo. <laughs> Every time we talk about him, I always think of how he like rolled out, or according to him, he rolled out of his truck on the side of the highway and like then rolled underneath of it and <laughs> had his shotgun <laughs> holding onto it, <laughs> laying under the truck. Yeah, the way he tells it, it's like a, it'd be like the greatest movie of all time. So this was pretty much ignored. Didn't attract any new members. So they went back underground for a couple more years. And we've talked about through the series that Doe struggled with his sexuality and that sex should be avoided at all costs, specifically because once you transfer to the next level, the alien being you would become would be genderless. So there's no need to have sex. You just get rid of that. We're going to talk about this more later in the episode. But this next detail seems to be a big factor in what's to come. There was a longtime member of the group named Dick Jocelyn, a.k.a. Dinkody, 
Is your dick jostling, or are you just happy to see me over there? <laughs> it's uh, it's got to be one it's moving around a bit. I see <laughs> greatest names of all time. Dick jostling. <laughs> <laughs> Should probably go by Richard there, Pally. <laughs> guy's born to be the pocket pool champion of the world, right? <laughs> He's already got the name. So he joined early on. In, uh, he joined in 1975. He was a really good looking younger guy, Was in did some acting, and he was gay. Once T died, Dick Jocelyn became one of those closest followers, like kind of like an inner circle type member. Around the time of the 88 update coming out, Doe pulled Dick Jocelyn aside and it's like, there's a problem. My vehicle is attracted to your vehicle. And Doe just shut him out. Poor Dick. I mean, my vehicle is attracted to Megan the Stallion's caboose, so I completely understand this. (laughs) Going to park that vehicle in her garage? (laughs) Uh, this was really devastating to Dick Jocelyn because he was a really committed follower and Doe just basically shunned him. And it event- thankfully for Dick Jocelyn, he became disillusioned and left the group around 1990. He's thanking his lucky stars, huh? It's tough being hot. Didn't your frat almost uh, expel you, Mike, because you were so hot taking all the girls, right? They started making <laughs> you take estrogen or something. <laughs> Calm you down a little bit. It was my nickname in college was Dick Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs> Due to the group shrinking to under 30 followers, in 1991 and into 1992, the group reemerged for about four months and they bought 14 hours of airtime to air a series on satellite TV called Beyond Human. During this series of lectures about their beliefs, Doe started alluding to the year 2000 and that it would bring the end of everything and their exit would happen to the next level. Again, they were ignored. This didn't get them any new followers, but it did bring a few old ones back to the group. I mean, as far as cult guys go, he's not real. It's not really on the successful side of the business, you know? He has trouble attracting people with these ideas, it seems. Yeah, I mean, we said in both part one and two, it's a special type of person that would even join this in the, in the first place. But as it goes on and on, as the years go on, it gets more and more confusing when you try to read anything that they talk about mm-hmm. or that he like the 88 update. It's 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 mind numbing and everything else that they've ever put out is really mind numbing. It's like, I don't know what I'm reading right now. You might as well be reading the Bible. Yeah. They, yeah they don't really define themselves or have a clear set of beliefs, nor is he, you know, the most charismatic man in the world. And so I think it just fails to attract people. I mean, and we've read, you know, about clams and Elrond's nonsense books, and, you know, <laughs> talk about it off the rail. I understood Scientology easier than I understood. <laughs> that says it all there. Stuff. <laughs> there you go, buddy. That says it all. <laughs> also, could you imagine being up at like two o'clock in the morning watching TV and like public TV, whatever, and uh Marshall Applewhite pops on there. Yeah, you're like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Probably very similar to when I was, you know, uh, up at 2 a.m. watching that Scientology channel when I went through a week of watching that. Yeah, nonstop. right. You were at risk. That's some weird shit, man. He almost succumbed to the allure of uh, I almost joining let, Elrond. Almost let him audit me. <laughs> your cock? Yeah. Audit your cock? Well, they can do that for free. So he starts alluding to that the end was going to be coming in the year 2000 was going to bring it. He just didn't know what at the time. He was just kind of alluding to it. Then the siege in Waco happened. Seeing what happened at Waco and at Ruby Ridge gave Doe the idea that maybe they could just bring their exit into the next level onto themselves. Doe came up with a statement titled, Our Position Against Suicide, which was later posted to their website sometime in 1996 or 1997, And this laid out how they could exit their vehicles. It said in part, We fully desire, expect, and look forward to boarding a spacecraft from the next level very soon in our physical bodies. There is no doubt in our mind that our being picked up is inevitable in the very near future. But what happens between now and then is the big question. We are keenly aware of several possibilities. It could happen that before the spacecraft comes, one or more of us could lose our physical vehicles due to recall, accident, or at the hands of some irate individual. We do not anticipate this, but it is possible. 
Another possibility is that because of the position we take in our information, we could find so much disfavor with the powers that control this world that there could be attempts to incarcerate us or to subject us to some sort of psychological or physical torture, such as occurred at both Ruby Ridge and Waco. These are their stories. (laughs) (laughs) So then the month after everything happened at Waco on May 27th, 1993, Doe placed a very apocalyptic one-third page ad in the USA Today that they bought for $30,000, and this was under the name Total Overcomers Anonymous, (laughs) and it was titled UFO Cult Resurfaces with Final Offer. Like all of their other stuff, it was really long, laid out all the stuff about the next level, but now Doe is saying that the earth was about to be, quote, spaded under or recycled because of people's lack of evolutionary progress. And he made this quote final offer for people to contact the group and join them in the next level. I like, I like this final offer stuff. Like you better hurry. Our vehicles were accident. Last chance. I also like how the USA today was just real loose with their ad placement back in the day. Yeah, right. They're like, Hey, pay us, play us 30 <laughs> K. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll print that. <laughs> This got them about 20 followers to join, some new and some old ones to come back. But this really wasn't about recruitment. This was more of a, like, hey, government, look at us. Look at this crazy UFO call talking about the end of the world. Come come shoot us up like you did Waco. God damn. But like everyone else in the world had done so far, the government either just ignored them completely or didn't notice the ad. Poor Marshall. <laughs> he he can't, can't get to save himself. He can't get anyone to pay attention. Worst to cult leader ever. Yeah. Is it really that hard to get the attention of the government? I mean, there's a couple of surefire ways or things that if you do, <laughs> you're sure to be on their radar going forward. He thought by just speaking this nonsense yeah. that they're going to be like, oh, we need to go shoot right, them up. Right. <laughs> like, like Ian, for instance, with that pizza pic he posted today, like he's on the NSA's culinary cunts list or something. <laughs> culinary cunts list. <laughs> I've been flagged by the NSA. <laughs> this guy has no taste at all. How's he operating out there? John Taffer is going to come to his house and just say, shut it the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> the pizza's raw. <laughs> just a giant Lunchable over there. <laughs> The FBI did have a file on Marshall Applewhite, but it was only a couple pages long, and it was only made because of family members of followers went to the FBI for help. The file basically says there's nothing going on there. People who follow him are adults. They can do what, what they want. It's They didn't give a fuck about Marshall Applewhite. He's not doing anything. He's just a weird <laughs> UFO <Right>. guy. <laughs> you could say that. Same thing about half the influential UFO VIPs across the country. In 1994, they went back out on the road again, trying to recruit and spread their message. But again, they were met with rejection. We're getting the band back together, man. (laughs) They're out on the road. Reunion tour. (laughs) See that? No, that would have been good. Heaven's Gate, the reunion tour. Sell t-shirts with like the dates on the back. It's like the Blues Brother remake, but with Marshall Applewhite. Yeah. That would be all right. (laughs) They videotaped a lot of these public meetings that they held and the questioning and kind of heckling they got was brutal. There's even one guy in a video where he's in the audience and he remembered them coming from the (laughs) seventies and he was basically like, yeah, weren't, weren't there two people here before named Bo and Peep? And they said there was a UFO coming to pick them up. Did that ever happen? And <laughs> He's like, did that happen? Cause uh, I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's really funny. Hey, yeah, uh, how's he- the mothership doe? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking troll. Man. That's great. I love it. Some of it's uncomfortable too. Cause there's, there's one where this young guy was sitting in the crowd and he's like, I'm confused. I don't know anything more about, what you've talked or what you are than I did when I walked in the door. And it's just like <laughs> brutal questioning, mm. just complete, complete failure. Oh, poor Marshall. So with all these failures, Doe held a group meeting and asked if anyone would be opposed to willfully exiting their vehicles. 
and he brought this up, up all the way back in 94. He spun this as it wasn't truly a suicide. It would be suicide to stay on Earth and pass up the chance to enter the next level. He wasn't saying that they were going to do it that very second. It was just a feeling out question. Like, if we get the sign from the next level, would everyone be willing to exit their vehicles? Well, I guess they were all on board because that's your cue to get the hell out of there if not, right? Yeah, I think uh, if I remember correctly, five people left after that meeting. Mm. Oh, that's like half the group. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably some of those newer people. Like, yeah. They're like, uh, what? what's this now? Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> My uh, vehicle? Uh, what? What's this? <laughs> In 1995, they went back into seclusion. And the group lived in a rural part of New Mexico. They bought 40 acres of land and tried to build a compound, which they referred to as the Earth Ship. They used tires and wood to build it. Doe was hoping to start a monastery with this, I guess, building, compound, whatever you want to call it. But they weren't really the building type people. And <laughs> it was really hard just to fucking build a this compound. This pile of wood like, scraps, you mean, Ian? <laughs> yeah. Entire. So, like, does anyone have get... any nails? <laughs> Not exactly planners, are they? <laughs> this guy's ridiculous. <laughs> so, and as the weather started getting cold, and they just gave up on this idea and went back into living in high end houses in the San Diego, California area. <laughs> sounds better. Yeah, I don't understand where this idea <laughs> came from, but <laughs> Ian Jeffrey Epstein had a big ranch out in New Mexico. Is there any chance that there is a relation here to Jeffrey Epstein? Oh, how many fucking questions or, or requests <laughs> we're going to get now to cover Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> Speaking of Jeffrey Epstein, I've been watching that docu series on Netflix about him. It's pretty good. Is it? Yeah, I like it so far. It's interesting, and that's the closest we'll ever get to covering Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's how he says that. <laughs> So after all these failures, the group turned to the Internet as a way to spread their message. One of the biggest misconceptions about Heaven's Gate is that they were an Internet cult just because they had a website. Their attempts to recruit via the Internet were also failures and met with rejection. Looking for one successful thing this cult has done. Yeah. <laughs> Other than they tried to kill themselves and they did succeed in that. They open a lemonade stand or something, something to make a little bit of money. Well, they probably bought the supplies, but then they were like, well, we don't know how to do this. <laughs> do it. Anyone have a lemonade recipe? Yeah. <laughs> the archive that I found of one of their posts was from September 26, 1995. But they could have started doing this earlier in 95. They hopped on Usenet, which was, if I'm correct, the first message board on the Internet, or at least the most popular at the time. Yeah, back from the first days of the Internet. Also, if I understand it correctly, it's kind of like 4chan without the pictures and not as scummy where you can just talk about whatever you want. It's separated into categories like boards and stuff, right? Yeah, that sounds right. All that stuff's still active, I think. Some of those es esoteric original Internet people are still on there using it. With their dial-up connections. <laughs> yeah. I stick to a 14.4 baud modem when I log on to the <laughs> Usenet groups. Doe started spamming with what was pretty much a manifesto titled Undercover Jesus Surfaces <laughs> all over Usenet boards that were pertained to them. So like religion, Christianity, sci-fi, sci stuff like that. But when he was posting on sci-fi boards, it was titled The Real Q and E.T. Speaks Out. Man, how do you not click Clever. that? Clever. You're like, <laughs> I got to hear what this guy has to say. These posts, these postings were extremely long, again, laying out the belief system. But there was a lot of talk about, quote, laying down our bodies and alluding to something like Waco happening. There's a section that I pulled out that I thought was it's kind of lengthy, but I thought it was relevant to read because the language was, was a lot more aggressive than what anything that they had previously said before. How is this laying down of our bodies to occur? If you do recognize me and choose to look for to me for guidance, I would recommend that you purchase firearms, get comfortable using them or partner with someone who can and somehow position yourselves separate from others enough to not be vulnerable so that you might establish a relationship with me. 
protected from interference as far as possible. In this day and time, the authorities make no bones about their need to protect the public from dangerous radicals like us. They will aggressively attempt to require us to abide by their values and their rules, which are of this Luciferian world and its society, as difficult as that might be to believe. They won't hesitate to trump up charges or suspicions in order to search us or take us into custody so they can judge for themselves whether or not we are some kind of a threat. There is no need for us to be submissive to their wishes, such as to their search or custody questioning, when we know we have broken none of God's laws. Not only have we done nothing wrong, but our total existence is devoted to entering and offering God's world. Our choosing to not be submissive, coupled with being armed, pretty much addresses the laying down of our bodies question. There is also the possibility that my older member will physically visit me in order to validate or confirm the appropriate unfolding of our exit plan, as was permitted before at the Mount of the Transfiguration when I asked, can this cup be taken from me? If my father does not require this disposition of us, he will take us up into his cloud of light, spacecraft, before such confrontation need occur. If I receive a change of instruction, which includes going to trial and the death of my body, is a part of that experience, then as far as I am concerned, any and all of those who are a part of me have my permission to join me as soon as they choose to. Oh, that's clear. I get it. Thanks for <laughs> clarifying that, Mike. <laughs> Makes complete sense. Huh? <laughs> He's really like the whole first part. He was like kind of like de defining themselves as Waco, right? Like we're a religious group. We have guns. They see that as a threat because we, you know, they, they want to try to control us. So I read it. I found this to be the most interesting part of redoing this whole series is I did not know that they were basically trying to get the government to come kill them. I knew nothing about this, all this Waco tie in stuff with them. That's an interesting yes. point. Yeah. Your Google probably wasn't working back in 2019. So you never came across that. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> These Usenet postings, like people reacted exactly how you would expect them to they were rejected or ignored in the archive that i found of this particular post had a bunch of comments along with it there were people saying like you know fuck off you're not yeah you know, <laughs> sure buddy we're not joining your cult you mean they weren't just posting the meme of that girl with her hand up and it says the fuck <laughs> <laughs> the d-a-f-u-q because <laughs> that's what i would have posted that's great well, or in Ian terms, get fucked, Marshall. That's what people are saying. <laughs> they, they probably get fucked, doe. <laughs> <laughs> they branched out from Usenet after a while, and they started posting this message and similar versions of it to X-Files and Star Trek message boards. But again, nobody paid attention <laughs> to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this guy's marketing team. It's too bad. People on those boards are like, hey, we want to talk about Mulder and Scully. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, get the fuck out of here, you man. Asshole. We're staying in our vehicles. <laughs> X-Files is on tomorrow night. <laughs> we'll be right back. At some point in 1995, it's unclear exactly when, the need to get rid of any sexual desires took a really drastic turn. They had gotten to the point that if anyone had a wet dream, they needed to disclose it. And then that pushed to there being a sign out sheet that was required to be filled out in the morning on whether or not you had one. Ian Mike's raising his hand. I think he has something to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would make everyone who left my dorm room they had to fill out a little questionnaire. <laughs> Were you satisfied with this visit? <laughs> you know, things like that. Do you have a star system? They rate you like one to five. They could, yeah. They could. Yeah. <laughs> One morning, Doe held a meeting and said that he had a wet dream. And this was like a breaking <laughs> point. <laughs> this was like a breaking point for him. Between this and then being attracted to Dick Jocelyn, Doe asked the group if anyone would be willing to get castrated with him. Oh, Hallie, According to extreme. <laughs> yeah, it's taken it, <laughs> taken it pretty far. It's drastic. <laughs> this is interesting. Because this is like, I feel like this is further proof that he is a true believer and not manipulative. And he's manipulative, but not in the aspect of someone that doesn't believe it and is just trying to get, you know, that there's this end goal of money or sex or something like that, you know. 
Like a t- you would think a cult leader, if he was like the other ones, he's attracted to Dick Jocelyn. He would have just banged him. Yeah. It was all about the sex and the power from him. Right. But so he has he basically kicked J- Dick Jocelyn out of the cult so he would get, be able to get away from him and not be attracted to him anymore. And now he has a wet dream. And it's like, nope, I'm, I'm getting castrated. This, I'm done. That's all in there. Something. It's going to prevent According- me from getting to the next level. Take my balls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got to get there. The tea's waiting for me. According to some sources, it wasn't Doe who suggested the castration during this meeting. It was Sorodi, a.k.a. Stephen McCarter. He, he brought up the idea and then it just went from there. Sorodi was the first one to get castrated and they set up a room and it was going to be done by Lavodi, a.k.a. Julie Lamontagne and Genodi, a.k.a. Susan Strom. With Lavodi actually being the one to perform the castration because she used to be a nurse. Oh, she's qualified. <laughs> yeah, because you used to be at one point. Yeah. <laughs> After Sorodi's testicles were removed, the sack started to swell really oh. bad and he was in a lot of pain. Oh, I'm in a lot of pain hearing you yeah. say that. <laughs> I think a lot of people have this vision of castration like they cutting the whole sack off and not opening the sack and taking the testicles I, out. They're going to make me faint. <laughs> yeah, they just I get yeah, they open it up. Yeah. Like, you can't just cut the whole sack off. Like, you just have, like, an opening. <laughs> or, like, an open, so like, a huge wound. Like, I feel like the top of the sack's still there, but then it just, like, opens to nothing. Like, the rest is just all gone. So, you have just, like, this flap of the top of a sack just, like, hanging there. Uh, oh, I'm getting a little lightheaded. Yeah, I really am getting a little woozy. Hey, Mike, you want to hear a castration <laughs> joke? <laughs> Okay. A lot of people think castration and vasectomies are the same thing, but in actuality, there's a vast deference <laughs> to the procedures. <laughs> oh, man. What an inappropriate dad joke. <laughs> I was Googling uh, castration to read about it before this. Really? Really? I ran across that joke. I go, it's really funny. <laughs> According to defector and still dedicated believer, Sawyer, which Sawyer is not his real name, they panicked because they could get in trouble. So they called a local Catholic church to see if they had any experience in castration <laughs> and what to do. <laughs> well, of course. Who else would you call? <laughs> you guys castrate them kids when you're done with them, right, Father? <laughs> God damn. You guys do castration. <laughs> oh, sorry. Our castration guy's out this week. You'll have to call back next next week. <laughs> Catholic Church. Okay. According to Sawyer, the priest basic was like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, get, I don't get know get what to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they were panicking. I mean, the way that the story is told is he was in a lot of fucking pain and it was really swollen. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> And they didn't want to get in any trouble by taking him to a hospital right. because, you know, but they gave in and took him to the hospital. And Sawyer says that he and Genodi then went to a bridge nearby and threw Sorodi's testicles over into the water God to, like, damn. hide evidence. <laughs> it's the way the ball bounces, I guess, sometimes. <laughs> I like to think it, like, plops in the water. It's just like, boop, boop. There, go your, there are your balls. The fish immediately swallow them. the group didn't face any legal issues because of this incident but doe did abandon the idea of castration for the time being it wasn't until a year later sometime in 1996 that they found an actual doctor in mexico to do the procedure for them doe was castrated and depending on what source you read either seven or nine members in total had the procedure done too it's dedication man and since we're on Sawyer, or since we just talked about him, um, he's featured a lot in the HBO documentary. He was very committed to the group. He still really is. He's still a full on believer, thinking that there's a, still a shot that he will go back, that he'll join with them eventually. He got so wrapped up in the giving up sex thing that he kept having the wet dreams and stuff like that. And then he started masturbating. And he, like, couldn't get it under control. That, 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 that's it, why he was a defector? He left because of that? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Doe said that he would work with them. He was like, okay, so you're not trying to get other people to do it with you. He's like, you're not trying to like pollute the rest of the group. So I'll help you. Because he wasn't trying to like bang other people. He was just doing it himself. Right. And he just couldn't stop thinking about sex and doing it. And Doe gave him 600 bucks on a plane ticket and said, all right, we'll see ya. Be gone, vile pig. Yeah. Go forth and <laughs> fuck it away from us. <laughs> uh. He's really sad. It's really sad to watch him talk about it because he it's it's like the bit well, you can tell it's like the biggest regret of his life like his biggest failure that he couldn't get that under control and he missed his chance going with them. jerking off around his life <laughs> yeah are there any other people out there like this well i guess we can talk about it at the end but who just have missed their their chance like are there others of this guy or probably not because the group was so small it's just such an interesting concept that you know you escaped this group that ended up killing all of them but killing that's themselves. In, he's bummed about it though. yeah and to be bummed about that yeah. not after all these years not to have started looking at it you know through a different lens i guess now he's doing the old sad jerk off and that nobody likes that <laughs> so, <laughs> just looking at himself in the mirror with a pouty face <laughs> crying this cost me my chance at the <laughs> next level how would that sound? They'd be like, uh, 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 tears going down. Probably use the tears for a lubricant, right? Of course you could. Yeah. A little salty, but you know, what are you going to do? Don't love that. <laughs> There's another guy in the documentary, in the HBO documentary. I think we talked about him last week. Um, I know his first name's Frank. I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. But at the end, like the last episode, they're kind of wrapping everything up. And he talks about Sawyer because he was in the group with them. I mean, the the guy, Frank, he, I think he was in there for 18 years before he defected. And uh, he was he said he's like, he's like, Sawyer just hasn't moved on. He hasn't gotten any therapy or yeah. moved on with this whole thing at all. He's just kind of stuck. Sawyer also sings a really good song where he plays a harmonica and drums at the same time. And it's all about UFOs and stuff in the cult. Oh, I'm That's sure you cool. love that shit. <laughs> I think it's I think it's on episode two of the HBO <laughs> documentary. It's super funny. <laughs> it's like a one man band there. I like to think he has like the little symbols between his knees that he can clip, you know, <laughs> hit together. <laughs> it's kind of like that. It's pretty. <laughs> it was interesting. So in 1996, the group settled down and rented a mansion in Rancho Santa Fe, California, that at the time was worth $1.3 million. I think I looked at it on Zillow, and it was like $4.3 million is what it's worth now. Mm. It's like one of the richest communities in that area. Okay. Or neighborhoods. Between 1995 and moving to this mansion, they had started a website and graphic design company called Higher Source. And they were pretty successful at it, successful enough to rent this mansion after the trust fund had ran out. So they finally get a win here. It's something there we they're go. doing right. So maybe uh, Marshall's got good business acumen. Things are going to turn around now. This I is can it. feel it. This is it. Part four is going to be all about his success right. in the world. Yeah. Well, and there weren't a lot of freelance people <laughs> at the time from when I was reading, you know, and uh, a lot of them were really smart and really good with programming and early stages of the internet you know yeah. like they were pretty smart people mm. they also purchased the domain heavensgate.com and started posting all of their materials online like you said earlier the website it often gets misrepresented as something that was used to recruit new members but really it was their way of preserving their information for the rest of the world and because by now recruitment had officially failed that was just done they haven't had a successful recruiting attempt since the 70s really yeah do some flirty fishing send your girls out there to fuck yeah. for <laughs> fuck for dough like uh children of god <laughs> seems pretty successful that's the way to do it fuck for your ticket to next level <laughs> the website also gave them their official name that people know them as now they never called themselves heaven's gate uh, by this time, they had abandoned the human individual metamorphosis name, and then that other uh, what, what did we say earlier? TOA, the something anonymous, offenders yeah. anonymous, outliers anonymous, something like that. Yeah, total overcomers anonymous. <laughs> yeah, what does that, what does that even mean? <laughs> 
Mike, you had to well, join that group in college, yeah. right? <laughs> After you hosed all those ladies down. <laughs> You are a total overcomer. <laughs> we call it supercomers, though. That was a supercomer. <laughs> they gave up on all those names. By this time, they were just calling themselves the class. And Heaven's Gate was just the door that would open to get into the next level. Doe had brought up willfully exiting their vehicles back in 1994. And this whole time, they had been trying to provoke the government to come and attack them or... They were waiting for a sign or what they called a marker. And then they got their sign on November 18th, 1996. Dun, dun, dun. It's very ominous. I would say it's no surprise that the followers of Doe were regular listeners to Coast to Coast AM and Art Bell. Like that was their nightly routine to yeah. listen to. Him. Didn't we say Ian would probably have joined this cult? Did we say that <laughs> on one of the first two episodes? I mean, as soon as he saw UFO, he's sense, like, I'm right? going to that. Yeah. <laughs> Go to their seminar, check it out. <laughs> On November 18th, 1996, a guy named Chuck Schrammick from Houston called Art Bell with some news. He had, fo- he had taken a photograph that showed a mysterious Saturn-like object behind the hale comet. He estimated that it was up to four times the size of Earth. When he called the show, Schrammick said a photograph of the comet he had taken four days earlier clearly showed a bright object with a halo around it like Saturn. And when he checked a, a map, a star mapping computer program, it showed that no star existed there. So there shouldn't have been anything there. Uh-oh. Obviously, Art rolled with this, because why not? What this do you like, think it pro- is, caller? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard the clip of him <laughs> talking about this? You know, like, well, I what don't specifically it, remember. <laughs> <laughs> What's back there? <laughs> yeah, because he had this guy, this guy on next, the next like this professor, Courtney Brown. And then when he gets him on the line, he's like, Professor, what the hell is that thing? <laughs> 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 so this Courtney Brown guy that called in the next night was the director of the Farsight Institute in Atlanta. Um, he... I guess the Farsight Institute is like this, um, another metaphysical kind of thing, UFO kind of stuff, I guess, uh, because he claimed that three professional psychics that were associated with his institute had used remote viewing to detect that the object behind the hale comet was a metallic UFO with aliens aboard. Oh, and here I thought Farsight was just a NASA department or something, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Courtney Brown is the professor of... <laughs> something that employs psychics to yeah, do remote yeah. viewing. <laughs> yeah. They were sold on this. This was like, like, Oh, this is our sign. So the group went out and bought a high powered telescope, but they didn't see anything behind the comet. So they returned the telescope back to the store and said it didn't work. <laughs> Fucking things broke. We can't even see it. <laughs> well, th- there's an interview with the guy that worked at the tele at the telescope shop or whatever, wherever they bought it. And he's like, yeah, they came, they came and returned it, and they said it didn't work. They couldn't see what they wanted to see. And he's like, well, what do you mean it didn't work? Like, what were you looking for? And they said the Hale-Bopp companion. And then he just walked out and left. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So the, this whole UFO thing, you know, UFO following the Hale-Bopp comment was pretty quickly proven to be a hoax. But that didn't matter to Doe and the group. This was still a sign that they had been waiting for. When Doe met T in 1973, the Kohotek comet was visible from Earth. And now in 1996, the Hale-Bopp comet was visible from Earth. So this was officially the sign. Okay, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> with that, they updated their website with the flashing red message, red alert, hale brings closure to Heaven's Gate. And they started preparing for their exit. They started to open up a bit through December and into 1997. They had a Christmas party in December that they filmed where they were singing songs and had a talent show and were like baking. It looked like pies and stuff like they they seemed extremely happy, like hugging each other, laughing. Like if you watch those videos and you didn't know what was going to happen in a couple months, you would never think that these people were going to commit mass suicide. It's creepy. And it's very creepy. 
in February 1997, they started doing a bucket list kind of a thing. They traveled to Las Vegas and stayed at the Stratosphere Hotel. They went to Cirque du Soleil and recorded their winnings at the slot machines and gaming tables at $58.91. Ballers. Uh, Big winners. They, they, <laughs> they meticulously tracked everything in this cult. Like they wrote down dollar amounts for everything. Everything was kept track of. They went to some theme park and rode a free fall ride called the Big Shot. That cost one hundred twenty three dollars for all of them to to ride it. It's <laughs> <laughs> a hell of a deal. Yeah. Um, and then a few weeks later, they went to Sea World and to the theaters to see one of the Star Wars movies. You wait, team, it's having a good time, going out with a bang. Then in March nineteen ninety seven, they went into deep seclusion. They cut off all their clients from their business higher source. They basically sent out a message to them. Um, said the hail Bob Comet was bringing a close to their business and they would not be working for them anymore. Which if you were a client, you'd be like, what the fuck's the hail Bob Comet got to do with you not making my website anymore? <laughs> <laughs> but around this time, Neody, a.k.a. Rio D'Angelo, went to Doe and told him that he felt that there was something he needed to do outside of the group. I think Rio D'Angelo was thinking on the fly here. <laughs> because <laughs> he was he was a newer member he was not this guy had not been in for very long he told doe that he didn't want to leave the group but he had been offered a full-time job on the outside working for interact entertainment which was a company that often used higher source for web design after a couple of days doe told d'angelo that he had talked to t telepathically of course uh, of course and Ian. we know she's already <laughs> left her vehicle duh <laughs> and he felt that it might be part of the plan that d'angelo had been chosen to tell the rest of the world about the group's message good move d'angelo <laughs> after d'angelo was given the task the group moved forward with their plan they purchased matching black shirts and pants the shirts had a heaven's gate away team patch sewn on the arm uh, which was a throwback to their favorite show, Star Trek. <laughs> that was one of the only approved TV shows that they were allowed to watch really? in the house. That's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. I just read basically all they watched. William Shatner, Captain Kirk just turned 90 this week. You would think I would have gotten into Star Trek at some point in my life, but I have never been able to huh. get into it. Yeah, I like the original one. Then they all went out and bought matching black and white Nike decade shoes. There was a lot of theory. It's like back, like you read news news reports from back in 97 about why they were all wearing the same shoes. Like if there was some meaning to it, and then eventually it came out that they just got a good deal on them <laughs> because they bought them in bulk. <laughs> Thrifty till and the end. Had, very, very and good. Well, and then Nike stopped <laughs> making them, right? Because of all this? Yeah, they pulled them and they never made them again. <laughs> <laughs> They've made some similar ones that look similar to them, but the as far as I know, the official Nike decade shoe is was done uh then they headed to a local restaurant and all had the same meal which was a chicken pot pie so they all were in the same outfit they all walk into the <laughs> restaurant and they all order the same meal well were they wearing them at, at that I time the way it says i don't i'm not i don't think they were wearing the outfits at the same time damn would have made it a lot better yeah but there was an in, there is a news interview with the waitress that was uh, serving them, huh. and she did say it was really fucking weird how they all <laughs> just all kind of looked the same and all just ate a chicken pot pie, and that was it. That is not a great final meal, a pot pie. No. Well, it's not their final meal; it's their final restaurant meal, right? Yeah, well, whatever. Well, I mean, that's just... living it up to them—a chicken pot pie. They've been eating like oatmeal and shit for the past twenty oh. years. It's true. This is this is big time for them. I enjoy chicken pot pie. I don't want that as my final meal. No. On March 17th, the group filmed their exit statements, which you can find those on YouTube. And that's in the VHS. When I bought that stuff from them, that's part of the VHS tapes. It has Damn. some of the exit statements on it. It's a, it's a weird mixture to watch, though. Some people seem really happy. Some people seem really sad, like maybe they don't really want to do it, but they're just going with the flow one lady does really seems like that mm. Are, is this outside were they sitting outside yeah yeah i remember watching this and marshall his is his exit statement is the one 
where the camera has that weird glitch where it's like showing a reflection and he's got the chair next to him for tea. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he's he's all choked up. You know, he starts talking about tea and points to the chair. He says the chair is for her and stuff. And he's crying like it's pretty intense to yeah. watch him. I think we used that picture on our socials this past week. You could check it out. The, the one thing about the exit statements, even the ones people that are really it, it doesn't matter if they're really happy or crying, getting upset, talking through them. They all really mimic the way Marshall Applewhite or Doe talks. It's like the same kind of cadence of speaking. Do they also they do, the, do they do the no blinking also that he's famous mm-hmm. for? No, there's a couple members that have that really weird eye thing going on. But it might just be because they're really like don't eat very well. Like yeah. they're real sunken looking. Yeah. Because, you know, like the one girl, her name is Gail. I can't remember her last name. She joined the group. She was really young. She was the youngest member that died there. She was in her 20s. She joined way earlier. If you see a picture of her from like right before she joined the group to her during the exit interviews, it's crazy. It doesn't even look like the same person at all. Really? She's so sunk in looking. Her hair's all cut off, you know, no makeup. But yeah, her face is just real sunk in. And it's very, it's really creepy to look at the before and after pictures of the members. So then on March 23rd, 1997, when the hail bomb was closest to Earth, 15 members of the group took phenobarbital with applesauce and a shot of vodka. And they placed plastic bags over the head, over their heads to assist in the process of committing suicide. The next day, on March 24th, 15 more members committed suicide the same way as the first group. And Doe was part of this group, which is interesting because the third group could have left at that point and said the leader was dead. Yeah. Huh? I don't love this so much anymore. <laughs> this is yeah. not being fun. Yeah. The castration, <laughs> yeah. that was cool, but I think I'm going to get out of here. Yeah, what do they do like the rest of the people on a second, you know, on the the night after the first people do? So how many more are there? Like 24 other people? You think they're just sitting around the house, hanging out, and, you know, 15 of their friends are upstairs dead? Right. It's a little creepy. Well, they're getting, they're p- putting the bodies all ritualized, right? With the, mm, like the little yeah. purple things. And I don't love that you don't yeah. take enough drugs to not need the bags over your head. I don't love the bag thing. It's very, uh, like, that's awful. It, it's panicky to think about it. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And it's creepy to think about it, too, like just to visualize the whole process. Yep. Then on March 25th, the remaining nine committed suicide in the same way. A few days later, Rio D'Angelo received a FedEx package while he was at work. When he opened it, there was a letter that read, quote, by the time you read this, we will have exited our vehicles. The letter also instructed D'Angelo to bring a video camera and record the scene so it was depicted accurately. Does he know this package is coming? He said he didn't. He said that he didn't know that they were actually going to do it. I don't I don't think that's accurate. But and if you I I think it's available on YouTube, it's available somewhere on the Internet. His footage, they use it in some of the HBO documentary. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that, you know, walking around and all the bodies and everything. D'Angelo went to the house in the branch of Santa Fe. He sprayed cologne on his shirt and pulled it up over his nose before going in. And all the members were in their black outfits, Nike shoes, had plastic bags over their heads, and were covered with a purple shroud. Everyone besides the last two that died, they had plastic bags over their heads, but no purple shroud because there was no one to Makes lay sense. it on them. Yeah. If I remember correctly, it took a while until he got there, and it was particularly warm for a few days, I think I recall reading, right? Cool. Yeah, it was California. I think it was about, it was pushing a week. So, you I, know, I don't five think it days smelled to a good week. in there. No, nope. no. Nope. The article I read, he talked back in the day, he talked to, I think it was Newsweek. The article I read, he was talking about putting the cologne on his shirt. He said that didn't even it didn't do a thing. Oh. And when he walked in, it was just like the smell was unbearable to try and walk oh. through and try and v- videotape everything like he was instructed to do. Oh. <clears throat> uh, everybody, all the members, too, they were all in bunk beds and most of them were in bunk beds. A few were on like like folding tables, like uh, like card table kind of things. 
And then Doe was in the master bedroom upstairs in bed by himself. Still laid out the same plastic bag over his head with the purple shroud. Just he was alone in the master bedroom. His testicles escaped the escaped <laughs> long before. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. They were not there that day. Also, they all had $5.75 in their pockets, which was five $1 bills and three quarters. Um, I, I always had heard or read a couple different places that it was a joke about the price of a bus that they used to take. But according to Sawyer, it was actually from a Mark Twain story that they liked where Mark Twain said $5.75 was the price to ride a comet to heaven. Did they account for inflation? Because I mean, five seventy five <laughs> back in Mark Twain's day. I don't know if they had enough money. You know. I think the comet business stayed It'd pretty be, consistent. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> it's like, sorry, it was six bucks this time. You're 25 cents short. None of you were coming aboard. Sorry. D'Angelo then called in an anonymous tip to the police, and the rest of it is kind of history. At the end, it was 39 members, 21 women, and 18 men between the ages of 26 and 72. Most of them had been there from the very beginning, you know, from, from the 70s. God, just imagine how long that is. 97, they've been there since the 70s. Right. Yeah, I I can't remember her name. Call expert. Uh, she was talking about the the people that had been in the group for the long, like the longest time, you know, all that, time, you know, what, 75 till 1997, that it was like they had been taught to not be a person for so long. You know, they, they had given up their lives to the point of not even being a human anymore. So it really wasn't that hard to just give up your body. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, you got to have some level of dedication to be in there 20-something years. At least three former members committed suicide themselves in the months after the mass suicide. On March 6, 1997, Wayne Cook and Chuck Humphrey attempted suicide in a hotel in a way similar that was used by the group. Uh, Wayne Cook died, and Chuck Humphrey survived this attempt. Um, another former member, James Perky Jr., committed suicide by a self-inflicted gunshot wound on May 11th. Chuck Humphrey, who survived his first suicide attempt, uh, killed himself in Arizona in February of 1998. Were these, uh, like, these former members, did they, were they kicked out? Did they leave on their own? Like, I'm wondering why they're former members and yet they're still committing suicide. So, Wayne Cook, his story, his individual story is actually really in interesting. It's featured a lot on the HBO documentary. He and his wife were both part of the group for like the long haul and they had defected a couple times and then came back. He had left during the um, the castration thing pushed him out. Ah, yeah, I could see but that. His, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but his wife stayed. His wife was one of the ones that died. Um, so I don't know how much of his Damn. is mm -hmm. truly believing in it still or the fact that his wife was now gone you know i don't know yeah. he had been in there since the seven late, late 70s early 80s you know he, i mean he and his wife were, were long-haul people same with chuck humphrey and we we really didn't talk about it and i wish we would have that they allowed members to come and go really I think there we was mentioned no, that like in the first episode. Did we? I can't remember if we said it or not. Like you could go. He would. Marshall Appleway would give you money to leave. There was no thing like Jim Jones couldn't stand people leaving or defecting. You know, he's like, if you don't want to be here, don't be here. Or he even kicked some people out. Like if they weren't following the rules, he's like, all right, you got to go. True right. believers only. I, I guess with these guys, though, don't they realize that Hale Bob's not here anymore? How do they expect to meet everyone? That's yeah. True. I mean, this hail bop uh, FOMO, but it's gone, dude. You <laughs> missed it. It'll be back in like the year 42 something. So when I was talking to them, where did I get to that question? Okay. Because the, my, my first set of questions to them, they were talking about dough. Like they were still really talking about following the teachings. And I asked them if they believe that he will come back. And they said he will come back. He had already come back to earth five times before. <laughs> And I asked, um, I asked them if T was going to come back too. They said they didn't know if T would come back. All right. So they're just um, waiting on Doe. Yeah, seems like it. And they, 
as far as when you would be ready to enter the next level or when you how would you know if doe came back you would just know you <laughs> gotta have faith you would have the sign have faith. yeah 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 and like we've talked about a bunch and you know just talked about the emails that i had with them it's still very active and it's unchanged since 1997 you can email them and They'll send you their the book if you want. I think it's like 30, 35 bucks or something. And I actually did figure out who runs it, who the two members are. Intriguing. But I'm, I'm not going to out them. You goddamn cock tease. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I, I'm, I'm 100% sure I'm not the only person that has figured that out. It was actually easier than I thought. So I don't know. If anybody wants to do it, go figure it out. I'm not going to blast them on Wow. That. Well, wait. What happened to D'Angelo? He's not the one who runs it. Huh. Well, technically, he left the group, right? Do we know what he's I, up to I don't know now? if he's still if he's still a firm believer. The people who run it now, the two that run it now, are very much believe it. You can tell the they, way they answer questions. They had one ran out on a coffee run, came back, and everyone had already killed themselves. I'm like, well, fuck. <laughs> oh my God. The hell are we supposed to do now? <laughs> well, I guess we run the website till they come back and get us. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the story of Heaven's Gate. Mm, still, Hopefully we covered it all this time. Still creepy. The pictures are really creepy. We'll post them this week. But the, uh, I don't know, the, the crime scene photos, I guess, the uh, the suicide photos, pretty freaky. You know who didn't kill themselves? Jeffrey Epstein. When are we doing that episode, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> has, has Mike been getting blown up about this or something? <laughs> Is that why we're doing this? He gets, well, I, well, like when I was, when I said earlier, like I was making a joke, but he, we get requests for him fairly often. He's the most requested topic that mm. we get that we aren't going to cover. <laughs> Definitively aren't. Yeah. Well, I think Ian made that pretty clear earlier too. I mean, we still get Israel keys, but we intend to cover him. He's still, I think, our most requested. Yeah, maybe like 2023, we'll do yeah. the Israel keys one. <laughs> Fucking look at I would like, be interested in Jeffrey Epstein, but oh, I think he's. Gonna, I feel like it, we're gonna do I feel it, like it would all. be impossible to not break the rule pretty hard with that. I agree. I don't want to cover it. Yeah, it's very interesting though. They should all go watch whatever. What are you watching? That Netflix series you said? Yeah. What is go, it? Go filthy watch that. Jeffrey Epstein, filthy rich, or something like that. It's pretty interesting. I've seen the beginning of that where they're deposing him, like. You ever solicited child prostitution in France? He's like, I invoke my Fifth Amendment. And they keep going around <laughs> New Mexico. Same answer. New York. Same answer. So, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> they find. Yeah. I, if I remember that part correctly, too, they just uh, they just kind of stop. They're like, all right, this fucking asshole yeah. is not going to say anything. They <laughs> right. just quit asking him. <laughs> all right. Ian, you got anything else on uh, Heaven's Gate? The only thing that I wanted to throw in there. That was a was an interesting tie-in to how much they liked Star Trek. Is um, I, I believe I don't know, Dave. You probably know this better than me. That I think the actress Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant, is it what? How do you say the name? Uhura. 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 That is that. That's from the original TV series, right? Yeah, yeah. Her brother was a longtime member of Heaven's Gate. Like he joined mm. right off the bat in the seventies, huh. and he died. On that day. Like with the suicide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how hyped they were when they found out who his sister was? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we got a good oh, one. Sure. We got a good one. There might have only been 12 of us, but we got one. She has a pretty good interview, too. Uh, she was on Larry King about this whole thing. Oh, I'd like to watch that. Yeah. She basically just said my brother is a really intelligent person, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to belittle his memory by doing this, all this cult stuff, all this conversation of him being crazy. He was an intelligent person. And I respect whatever decisions he made in life. Wow. How old was her the, brother? The, I don't know. I'd probably say 50s, maybe. Mm. Something like that. The media coverage after this was pretty, pretty wild, too. Like the media really drug all of, all of them through the dirt. It's just crazy cult people like there was headlines calling marshall applewhite the gay guru on the front of newspapers Jeez. and stuff like just real wild stuff then saturday night live did a thing like the weekend after it happened with will <laughs> with will ferrell as of course uh, marshall applewhite oh man <laughs> like I, those pictures really so, brutal the, the suicide pictures are so wild that i'm sure it was like a gold mine to the media just having to be able to oh yeah print those and like the there 
um, there's an expert on the on the HBO documentary that was talking about that and all the media coverage coverage of that stuff. Like the media, he said it was just a overall issue that he had with the media in general, but that they're just going to grab stuff for headlines. They're not going to right dig down into the nitty gritty of the story and much like we just did the past three weeks yeah, just see that anybody can fall into a cult well you know. depending dave your final thoughts <laughs> you got some thoughts no it is what it is like i said i'm trying to have more empathy for cult victims it's so very nice i think it's very sad some of these people had to cut their balls off and then kill themselves like that needs to be the your sign to get the fuck out of there mm. when you need to be castrated to stay in this cult. Like if you're going to be next level, don't you want your your nuts? I think you need, you don't it. need it. I don't, you don't need them because you're not a gender uh, anymore, right? On, Isn't that man. what it was? Like you're just a, a genderless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there will be no sex at the next level, Dave. It's, I don't want to be at the next level. Then. <laughs> also, fun fact: we we're talking about Nichelle Nichols, her and Captain Kirk first interracial kiss on US TV, I believe. Interesting. Mm, that's right. I think I read that somewhere yeah. before. Star Trek, breaking the rules. Yeah, breaking down barriers. Great show. Okay. So we're all good? Only one other thing I wanted to bring up before we wrap it up is that uh, just our final thoughts on who was the real cult leader here and who wasn't. I I think after doing this whole outline, I mean, I thought it last time, but even more this time, I, I think there's more than enough that shows that Bonnie Nettles was the real leader here and Marshall Applewhite was her first follower. And this is kind of what happens when shit goes off the rails and the true believer becomes the leader. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, and it, well, and it seemed, you know, he struggled to maintain any type of identity or leadership yeah. after she died. So I, I 100 percent agree. He just started throwing stuff against the wall and nothing was sticking. It just seemed like he was looking for any way to. Get, get out of this world without you know trying to get the government to come in and kill yeah. them all like a waco thing like just any reason to just to get out yeah they say he was struggling uh, that's all i got i'm glad we did we redid it you feel good now you got you got this one uh, out of the way and you redeemed yourself you feel like i feel so i feel like it all right good for you man congrats thanks redemption yeah. is yours <laughs> well done well done <laughs> Uh, we got some patron shout outs, some brand new patrons, or look, some of these names are familiar. Maybe they're back for round two. We we redeemed ourselves in that area and they're, they're back for more. Um, thank you very much to Mel O, Bronco, Sean Thibodeau, Isabeau.necro.fan, Bradley, Lila Madden, Julie Blackwell, Pieces of Her Lying Everywhere, <laughs> Yusak Yusak, uh, Nudies on the Loose at Gmail. <laughs> Uh, little titties ain't pretty. I disagree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Everett Browder, Little Miss, Gnomesy, Tilly, Donald Minty Hughes, Emily Bosiker, Cameron Carmichael, Jesse Brackett, Candace Higgs, Mel, Travis Bolin, Aaron Orr, Kelsey Hoffman, Tim Foe, Henry Schultz, Morgan, Jody Peterson, Nicole Popplewell, Pop, Popplewell, Heather Coulard, Betty Drizzler, Alejandra Garcia, Blumpkin Blowout. Oh, yeah. There you go, Dave. Party time. <laughs> Brenda Lynn, <laughs> Taylor A., Cleveland Robinson the Fourth, Isaac, L. Rose Rohanna, Stick Figure Mike, Stephanie Paulson, <laughs> Kadena Morningbird, Stephen Bullock, Brother J. Lala and Mason. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Appreciate your guys' uh, patronage. Uh, Ian, you got anything for us? Uh, for iTunes, I have one for Sunshine Pistol and Bryn's Mommy. Thank you for the awesome reviews. Hell yeah. Thank you very much. Dave, you got anything for us? Nothing for me, my good man. All right. Uh, we are on... Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at Necronomapod, Patreon.com slash Necronomapod, and uh, for the U.S., at least at this point, um, Amazon.com, search Necronomapod, and we have all of our merch currently available. So we appreciate you guys listening, and uh, 
yeah thanks thanks for uh listening we'll check you next week all right you guys ready for a cool down beer cheers